Greetings, everyone, and welcome to R. Kelly Appeal TV, where we discuss the topics relating to the Chicago trial and the federal Brooklyn appeal for Robert Sylvester Kelly. Hope everyone is well today. And I want to send a shout out to all Kelly Nation supporters. And I want to say that we have a lot to discuss today. We have a 10 page motion that was filed on the 6th, which was today. We're going to go over what that is. And Vadim Glasman, Glasman was the one who uh, submitted that documentation relating to Mr. Jim Dare Goddess. So we're going to talk about that. And then we also have some information that I want to share with you regarding to the new laws that are out or that are lacking as far as what Robert Sylvester Kelly is going through himself in his own Chicago trial and how that may impact the, um, the ability for him to be exonerated of all charges in the R. Kelly appeal or in the R. Kelly case, not even withstanding an appeal. So we're going to get right into that. So I hope everybody's doing good and I hope you're ready for some good news. But um, let's get right into the motion. We're going to start reading it as of now. The United States District Court for the Northern District of Illinois, U.S. of America versus Robert Sylvester Kelly, a.k.a. R. Kelly, Daryl McDavid and Milton Brown, a.k.a. June Brown, case number 19 CR 567, to the judge, Harry D. Lennon Weber. And it's titled Emergency Motion to, to Quash Subpoena to Reporter and or for Protective Order. Now comes non-party jur journalist Jim Derogatis and the New Yorker magazine to respectfully move this court pursuant to Federal Rule Criminal Procedure 17C and the First Amendment U.S. Constitution Amendment 1 to quash the subpoena served upon him in the above caption case by defendant Daryl McDavid or for a protective order. And it is a footnote. So they concur in the Brandsburg versus Hayes in 1972. If the newsman is called upon to give information bearing only a remote and tenuous relationship to the subject of the investigation, he will have access to the court on a motion to quash and an appropriate protective order may be entered. Sounds like Derek Goddess needs some protection, so he thinks. So, in support thereof, movements state as follows. Number one, Mr. Derek Goddess is not a party or government witness. He is instead a reporter music critic, author, and associate professor at Columbia College, Chicago. As a journalist, he has reported extensively on defendants from the beginning of Defendant Robert Kelly's career and throughout the present trial for new organizations, including Chicago Sun-Times and the New York Magazine. In, in 2019, Derek Goddess authored the book Solace, The Case Against R. Kelly, published by Abrams Press. Number two, The New Yorker, founded in 1925, is a Pulitzer Prize winning weekly national magazine, which he published some of the most groundbreaking journalism and commentary of the last hundred years. The New Yorker engaged their goddess to report on defendants, including extensive coverage of U.S. versus Kelly, number 19, CR 286 in the Indy, uh, New York case, June 29, 2022. 13 articles their goddess authored for the New Yorker can be found at the following link, newyorker.com contrib contributors. Jim Dare Goddess. Number three, on August the 3rd, 2002, Defendant McDavid served Dare Goddess with the subpoena, Exhibit A, and you'll see that at the end of the motion, for trial testimony in this case. The subpoena did not include a check for witness fees, but Dare Goddess was nonetheless instructed to appear 
on September 6, 2022, because the subpoena is unduly burdensome, unresponsible, and oppressive under Rule 17C and the First Amendment movements, according request on an order to quash the subpoena or a protective order. Number four, the courts must also be alert to the possibilities of limiting impingements upon press freedom to the minimum. And one way of doing so is to make compelled disclosure by a journalist a last resort after pursuit of other opportunities have failed. And then they use the Gulliver's periodical and uh, that was in 1978 and the Hare versus Zytec in 2006, requiring defendants to establish via proffer a tri at trial that they have a real need for the information and that the information is not available from another source. Patterson versus Berg, 2005. Surely some good justification should be advanced to justify subpoena of journalists regarding news gathering. Well, if he was so into his life, into R. Kelly's life at the time, wouldn't it seem that he would want to come in and share some information? But to, pull, to refuse it is something. Is it something there that needs to be considered? in the eyes of the jury. Just my point of view about this. I'm not done reading the whole motion. So let's keep going. The foregoing principles apply to news gatherings, irrespective of previously published work on the confidentiality of sources, because the policy which underlies the existence of journalistic privilege would be equally undermined by compelling reporters to reveal Factual information surrounding investigations. Neil versus City of Harvey. And this is 1997. Now, if I'm reading this correctly, they're basically saying that when he did the reports on the individuals in which he used, um, this was important information that could make or break R. Kelly at the moment he's in right now. So was that legitimate? Was that legal? to do so when he had major information and prosecution never called him forward. We're on the defense side now. So for them to request this is very weird when prosecution was taking so much of Jim Derogatis's information and building a, a, a criminal case, a federal case upon Robert. So what's your views? Because this is what I'm getting out of this docket right here. Number six, here, as demonstrated by the articles linked above, virtually all knowledge that Derogatis has that may be relevant to the indictment in this case, if there is any such information, necessarily derives from his third party source with direct knowledge of the facts. They should be able to use that. 1996. In the Lorillard Incorporated, affirmed trial court's exclusion of, Rob, of reporter witness under hearsay rules. Because Mr. Derogatis' role has been of an investigative reporter, compelled testimony also is invasion as to his news gathering methods and cumulative of the actual sources and their source material. For example, movements understand that the court already denied defendant McDavid's motion to put his news gatherings on trial with respect to alleged emails with potential official sources. Docket number 247. Movements further understand that during the case in chief, Chicago Police Department Detective Dan Everett authenticated the only physical source material plausible as issues. A VHS cassette personally handed to the detective by a Chicago Suns Times editor. Compare 735, a uh, defining source as inter alia, that means from, from or through which the news or information was obtained. Emphasis added. 
Moreover, the contents of this source material was authentic authenticated by Witness Jane and other sworn witnesses. And they use the low pass case of 1987 that says any further facts that might possibly be gleaned from journalist outtakes were likely to be merely cumulative. So they're saying that the information in which prosecution built their case was only hearsay. Number seven, the only pertinent ex exception to FRE 802, therefore, would be declarations against interests made by Defendant McDavid to Derogatis during the course of Derogatis' reporting, including for the New Yorker. Defendant McDavid, however, has represented that he will testify in his own defense and therefore may relate all of his on or off of the record statements to Derogatis leaving Derogatis in a potential position of impeaching his source or risking subsequent claims that he breached confidentiality, whether or direct examination or cross-examination by the USA or McDavis defendant. The footnote says, if required to testify, Derogatis requests that the court make a finding that the subpoena constitutes a waiver, so he wants immunity, by Defendant McDavid of any agreement to keep confidential statements made by McDavid to Derogatis, even if admissible under FRE 804b3. So I wonder why he would need immuni immunity. So it says also here, despite absence of blanket federal privilege, reporters are entitled to assert a claim to privilege that is rooted in constitutional rights with respect to the gathering of news or in safeguarding report reporters. At 724, courts must balance vital constitutional and societal interest of freedom of the press. While the Seventh Circuit has not yet recognized a blanket federal reporter's privilege, it does acknowledge that Illinois has First Amendment interest in protecting reporters. Uh, let me turn this do not disturb off. Okay. Um, reporters privilege. It acknowledges that Illinois it has the interest in protecting reporters. And um, it says, see Polish uh, Seventh Circuit 2003. So let me see. Number seven, the only pertinent exception to FRE 802, therefore, would be declarations against interest made by the defendant McDavid to Derogatis during the course of Derogatis' reporting, including in the New Yorker. Defendant McDavid, however, has represented that he will testify in his own defense and therefore may relate all of his off-the-record statements. And um, so they don't want to, Garcia says, who is herself the subject of the interview has failed to make any preliminary showing as to the nature of the statements contained in the outtakes. So there is some information that is missing in some of this information that prosecution, I believe, has uh, aired as of last week. I feel it's an error because even the Asa Cruel conversation from the motions that was filed has some things taken out. There was some outtakes. Number eight, the absence of a legitimate evidentiary need for testimony alone indicates harassment or intimidation. By Brandsburg, um, 709, intimidating by subpoena or by individuals unrelated, but sympathetic to defendants is of particular concern when coupled with prior acts and statements of a threatening nature that argument, the undue burden of being compelled to appear to answer irrelevant questions about admissions, news gathering activities. Hmm. And yeah, so let's look at this footnote. Number four, published reports include that a, a window of the Derogatis family home was shot out after Chicago Sun-Times reported on defendant Kelly and threats concerning Derogatis has then six-year-old, oh, that concerning Derogatis and his six-year-old daughter 
at the time. So, yeah, he's trying to protect himself for, and it's making the situation look kind of weird. And that's why McDavid, um, and, and so I guess this is why Derek Goddess needs a, a protection order. The absence of legitimate evidentiary need for testimony alone indicates harassment or intimidation. Prior acts. Okay, let me see. It's particular concern when coupled with prior acts and statements of a threatening nature that augment the undue burden of being compelled to appear to answer irrelevant questions about the admission newsworthy news gathering activities. Number nine, to rebut an improper purpose, McDavid should first pro offer that a. Derogatis possesses specific information relevant or necessary to the proceedings that a specific public interest would be adversely affected if the factual information sought were not disclosed. And C. That all other available sources of information have been exhausted. Showing that the, that the sought out information is highly relevant and material must be specific. Compare 735 ILCS. 9072 requiring specific factual findings before disdivestiture of Illinois reporter privilege can be ordered. Number 10, finally, because multiple witnesses testify from their direct knowledge on the facts material in the case, this court should exercise discretion to quash the subpoena on the reporter, Lopez 1987. Defendant in criminal case had not satisfied her burden of making a specific of how the outtakes she seeks are highly material to her case, emphasis in original. Wherefore, for the foregoing reasons, journalist Jim Derogatis and the New York <clears throat> Magazine respectfully request that the court exercise its discretion to quash the subpoena. Alternately, alternatively, Movements request the court to enter a protective order requiring a a specific showing by defendant that the prospective testimony satisfies the foregoing criteria under the First Amendment and b finding that the subpoena waives all claims of source confidentiality that defendant McDavid may hereafter assert or c authentic for authentication of previously published materials through stipulation or affidavit. Respectfully submitted, Jim Derogatis in the New Yorker. Damon E. Dunn, Esquire, and Seth A. Stern, Esquire, and Funkhauser, Vigozin, Leiben, and Dunn, Limited, 55 West Monroe Street, Suite 2410, Chicago, Illinois, Telephone number 312-701-6800. And then they show, of course, you'll see the exhibit here. And it's saying that the subpoena to testify at a hearing was today. And a uh, place of appearance and where it should go, what courtroom and the date and the time. So I'm just wondering what has taken place um, today we will probably know tonight or first thing tomorrow morning. So I will keep you posted. So what are your thoughts? To me, I feel that, you know, Jim Derogatis is, is in the Sun Times is trying to hide their hands in this situation when they were the ones who were promoting all of the witnesses and victims that came forth from the, um, Docu series, and you know the the Jane, of course, you know. So I just want to share that with you. And now we're gonna, um, as you speak on that, we're gonna leave some time in the chat for you to continue on with your thoughts that come up. It is very important and vital that we do share this uh, this information with you. So let me tell you. This article was published more than four years ago, and it is from the Washington Post. I thank Daddy Lolo from Celebrating R. Kelly Facebook page for sharing this information. 
It talks about fake pornography videos being weaponized to harass and humiliate women. Everybody is a potential target. This is what was happening back four years ago in 2018. Deep fake creditors are making disturbingly realistic computer generated videos with photos taken from the web and ordinary women are suffering the damage by Drew Harwell. You can look him up December 30th at 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, the Washington Post. A new technology is being used to put women's faces on porn stars' bodies, says Sarah Hashimi. The video showed the woman in a pink off-the-shoulder top sitting on a bed smiling a convincing smile. It was her face, but it had been seamlessly crafted without her knowledge or consent onto someone else's body. A young pornography actress just beginning to disrobe for the start of a graphic scene. A crowd of unknown users had been passing it around online. She felt nauseated and mortified. What if her coworkers saw it, her family, her friends? Would it change how they thought of her? Would they believe it was fake? I feel violated. This icky kind of violation, said the woman who was in her 40s and spoke on the condition of anonymity because she worried that the video could hurt her marriage or her career. It's this weird feeling like you want to tear everything off the internet, but you just can't. Airbrushing and Photoshop long ago opened photos to easy manipulation. Now videos are becoming just as vulnerable to fakes that look deceptively real. Supercharged by powerful and widely available artificial intelligence software developed by Google, these lifelike deep fake videos have quickly multiplied across the internet, blurring the line between truth and lie. But the videos have also been weaponized disproportionately against women, representing a new and degrading means of humiliation, harassment, and abuse. The fakes are explicitly detailed, posted on popular sites, and increasingly challenged to detect. And although their legality hasn't been tested in court, experts say they may protect, be protected by the First Amendment, even though they might also qualify as defamation, identity theft, or fraud. Disturbingly realistic fakes have been made with the faces of both celebrities and women who don't live in the spotlight. An, address, um, an actress, Scarlett Johannesson, told the Washington Post she worried that it's just a matter of time before any one person is targeted by lurid forgery. Johansson has been superimposed into dozens of graphic scenes over the past year that have circulated across the web. One video falsely described as real leaked footage has been watched on major sites more than 1.5 million times. She says she worries it may already be too late for women and children to protect themselves against the virtually lawless online abyss. Nothing can stop someone from cutting and pasting my image or anyone else's onto a different body and making it look as eerily realistic as desired. She said, the fact is that trying to protect yourself from the internet and its depriv depravity is basically a lost cause. The internet is a vast wormhole of darkness that eats at itself. In September, Google added involuntary synth synthetic imagery to its ban list, allowing anyone to request a search engine block request that falsely depict them as um, sexually explicit situations, but there's no easy fix to the creation and the spread. A growing number of these um, fakes target women far from the public eye with anonymous users on deep fakes, discussion boards, and private chats calling them co-workers, classmates, and friends. Several users who make videos by request said there's even a going rate about $20 per fake. The requester of the video with the woman's face atop the body with the pink off the shoulder top had included 491 photos of her face, many taken from her Facebook account and told other members of the deep fake site that he was willing to pay for good work. At Washington Post, reporter later found by her running these portraits through an online tool known as a reverse image search that can locate where a photo was originally shared. It had taken two days after the request for a team of self-labeled creators to deliver. 
a faceless online audience celebrated the effort. Nice start, the requester wrote. It's like an assault. The sense of power, the control, said Adam Dodge, the legal director of Laura's House, a domestic violence shelter in California. Dodge hosted a training session last month for detectives and sheriff's deputies on how deep fakes could be used by an abusive partner or spouse with the ability to manufacture pornography. Everybody is at potential target, Dodge says. Videos have for decades served as a benchmark for authenticity, offering a clear distinction from the photos that could be easily distorted. Fake video for everyone except high-level artists and film studios has always been too technically complicated to get right. But recent breakthroughs in machine learning technology employed by creators racing to refine and perfect their fakes have made fake video creation more accessible than ever. All that's needed to make a persuasive mimicry within a matter of hours is a computer and a robust collection of photos, such as those posted by millions onto social media every day. The result is a fearsome new way for faceless strangers to inflict embarrassment, distress, or shame. If you were the worst misogynist in the world, said Mary Ann Franks, a University of Miami law professor and president of the Cyber Civil Rights Initiative, this technology would allow you to accomplish whatever you wanted. Men are interested in the videos almost entirely as a joke. A popular imitation shows the actor Nicolas Cage's face superimposed onto President Trump's. But the fake videos of women are predominantly um, exposing how the sexual objectification of women is being embodied by the same type of A1 technology that could underpin the future of the web. And this goes on and on and on, but you get the point. And the point is that Robert Sylvester Kelly's situation could be the exact same. I mean, this stuff didn't just happen four years ago. This was in the making. It just became a an article four years ago. What are your thoughts on fake, on deep fake forums? What are your thoughts on that? I'm going to go to the next one. Now, that was four years ago. I'm going to go to the next one. Ready or not, mass video deep fakes are coming. This was in Technology of the Washington Post, a startup's appearance on Prime TV, heralds a new era, backers say. Others warn we should stay in the current one. An image of... America's Got Talent, in which deep fake company Metaphysics has a young Simon Cohen, Cowell, sing to the current one. The technology is gaining currency and controversy. And this was done August 30th, 2022 at 1.58 p.m. And it says, it was mainly out of self-amusement that Chris created a fake Tom Cruise. The special effects artists wanted to try something different during the doldrums of 2020. So working with a Tom Cruise lookalike, he used artificial intelligence and facial mapping technology to invent a series of comedic uh, deep fake videos and in early to 2021 unleashed them on TikTok. The account quickly became popular, then vanished from the public mind, replaced by the next viral diversion. So Ume is now back and on a mission to commercialize video deepfakes for the planned metaverse, making them essential to digital life as tweets and memes. He'll take that next step Tuesday when a deepfake developed by Metaphysics, the company he formed with entrepreneur Tom Graham, will compete in the semifinals of the NBC reality hit, America's Got Talent. This is a good chance to raise awareness and show off what we can do, said Ume. We think the web would be much better if it, instead of avatars, we lived in a world of hyper real, Graham added, describing users' ability to manipulate actual faces with metaphysics. The startup's appearance on one of the most watched summer network shows 
will lay the groundwork for Metaphysics' new website in which ordinary people can have their faces say and do things they never did in real life. Many other such sites are aimed at programmers and researchers. And the act, which will follow up a raucous, primarily round appearance that had metaphysics overlay a young Simon Cowell's face on the screen above a strange performer, will offer a shiny advertisement for a tech that's been democratizing with astounding speed. On Tuesday night, the company staged its new feat an opera performance with the faces of Cowell, fellow judge Howie Mandel, and host Terry Crews singing dramatically, all three, about the performance. Yet some critics are horrified by this celebratory moment on a top-rated television show. Video deepfakes, they say, blur a line between fiction and reality that's barely clear now. If disinformation peddlers can have so so much success with words and doctored images, imagine they ask what they can do with the full video. Do you see how R. Kelly has, you know, could have been targeted? I've always thought if he does not say that that's him on that video, I can't, I can't tend to believe it. I can't tend to believe it because anyone can create a fake in order to manipulate something, you know, especially if something was going to be submitted out years later, decades later. So I have a problem with this, you know, so the unveiling comes at the end of a summer in the world of deep fakes, which use the deep learning of artificial intelligence to create fake media Supporters prefer synthetic or artificial intelligent generated. That's why I always say sometimes this, this news, sometimes this black on black crime, all of the people being in the courtrooms, all of that are counterfeit opportunities for opportunists to create a fictitious society. I say that because that's how I look at news today. It's so superficially artificial to me. So many Americans were blissfully engaging in a quaint analogy activities like going to the beach, a startup named Mid Journey offered, artificial intelligent art generation in which anyone with a basic graphics card could, with a few keystrokes, create real images to spend even a few minutes with it. There's Gordon Ramsay, and that's what I mean when people fake it to make it. When you have people with the background in Chicago, but they're here in, you know, Brooklyn, you're going to be able to see and make sense of it, especially if you know the individual. You know what I mean? You're going to see if that is, is uh, what is that called? Just Photoshopped. Some people do it even on YouTube right now, you know, um, and on Facebook. They take backgrounds of images and download them and then put their cut out and crop out the body of the individual and post it and paste it right on what we used to call in 2006 a green screen. That's what it was because a green screen created the illusion. Wow. Mm -mm -mm. So it goes on. Um, but I want to say with this, we should be worried. I follow the technology every day and I'm worried, said Sabare, a professor at the School of Computing and Artificial Intelligence at Arizona State University, who has studied deep fakes and virtual identities. He said he expects the AGT moment will make platforms like these take off even further even as the technology improves by the day. It's moving so fast. Soon anyone will be able to create a moon landing that looks like the real thing. I truly believe NASA has already done that, but that's just my theory. I've always said that. No one has went to the moon because if it if it did, we would have like more people going to the moon, you know, other than NASA. That was just a million dollar 
um, ability to, you know, fake a grant, fake a system. NASA is the biggest, I believe, fraud there is, because if not, they would be able to, to detect more things happening. You know, even the skyrockets rising up and going into outer space and the first black, you know, astronaut, the first white astronaut. I mean, you know what I mean? It's like, what are your thoughts on that? That's just how I feel. I, I've looked at so many things in this world that was so unreal till how can I believe something like that? You know? As for ordinary users, Ume says the aim of metaphysics, metaphysics new site is to make online interactions feel more real. None of the whimsy of video games or flatness of Zoom. Do you see how they're just trying to create an illusory world for us to just assume that, you know, certain things can happen? Because of me, myself, personally, I've always said it's so easy. They were talking about doing a. They were talking about doing a uh, concert with Tupac and they were going to do it from. And Whitney Houston, after they died, they were going to do it. It's called, uh, I forget the name of it, uh, but I'll put it in the chat or I'll put it down in the description box. But they were going to do an illusory, um, an illusion to a concert. They were just going to just do that. And, you know... It's like having breakfast with Tupac and Tupac's gone and you live in California, but they take the picture of him where he came from. I think it might have been, you know, I don't know where I forget where Tupac was born. But yeah, it's so, so crazy. Deep fake technology began eight years ago with the use of generative adversarial ad adversarial networks created by computer scientist Ian Goodfellow. It essentially pit two AIs against each other to compete for the most realistic images. The results were far superior to basic machine learning technology. Goodfellow would go on to work for Google, Apple, and now DeepMind, a Google sub subsidiary. Skilled exploiters putting things into everyday people's range of use, attracting $7.5 million investments, the twins. Yeah, you can be excited for the new era in entertainment and social interaction, but the worry is the, div the uh, dividend in which a web flooded with video deep fakes muddies the water even for legitimate videos, causing no one to believe anything. So how are we going to live beyond the pandemic with this? So my point is to not to bore you with this. If you want to go back, you can go to the Washington Post and you can look at it. It's a very big article, August 30th, 2022, 1 58 p.m. by Mr. Stephen Zychik. But I just had to share that. I had to share that because I truly believe that even when I looked at the circle of the man's face on NBC or wherever they showed me the very first time of Robert being in that video with the curly hair and looking the way that he was looking. It just didn't look like him. It just didn't to me. And it might be hopeful and wishful thinking. OK, so I'll grant you um, all that. I, I, I grant that to those who are non-believers of R. Kelly's innocence. But I, I truly feel that it's going to come out because this information is now streaming, even though it was eight years ago, it's coming back. Okay. As you write in the chat box, I really want you to hear this final piece of information that I think will be very vital to the R. Kelly channel. Now, a day or two ago, Judge Mathis had a video that came out and it had, it was titled Dodging Child Support. 
So we're going to do some analytical study on this. It's a nine minute video. We're going to do a study on this. So let's let's listen. Plaintiff Erica Hoyt says when she started dating the defendant, she was only 15, but she lied and told him she was 18. Erica claims they had two children, but the defendant requested a DNA test for both of them. And both tests proved he was their biological father. Okay, so the first thing that we find out is she's deceptive. She's deceptive to the point where she could have put her kid's father in R. Kelly's position. You see what I mean? And so we're seeing more and more of this. That's why I tell you to pay attention to the the news that are, is coming out while his case is going on. Because there's something significant that's tying our subconscious thought together. So I want you to just hold on to that. She's suing because the defendant is over $17,000 behind in child support. Defendant Tramel Wright says from the start, Erica was deceptive and he could have done serious jail time for statutory rape mm -hmm. because she lied about her age. Tramel claims nine years ago, Erica fled the state with his kids and he hasn't seen them since. So he's countersuing for emotional distress. Start with you. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, I met Mr. Wright back in 2001. I was 15 years old. It was shortly after the murder of my father, so it was a very traumatic uh, time in my life. Mm. Um, I met Mr. Wright in a teen nightclub at that time. I lied to mm. Mr. Wright and told him I was 18. With so the problem with that is an adult being at a teen nightclub. You know, an adult being at a teen nightclub. That's that's off. That's off. Something is wrong there. What are your thoughts? In fact, I was only 15. Mm -hmm. um, after about four months of knowing Mr. Wright, I finally told him the truth. At that point in time, Mr. Wright told me that it didn't matter because he was in love at that point in time. Um, during the course of our rela four year relationship, excuse me, we've had, had we have had, excuse me, sir, your honor, um, two children. Um, the first one was had in uh, 2002, which at that time I was 16 years old. Were you all living in the same household with the children? Oh, yes, sir. Off and on. I stayed with some of his family members during the okay. course of the relationship. Yes, sir. So you had the second child? Yes. Mm -hmm. In 2004, um, I started receiving child support in 2005 um, for the first child. We had to do a DNA uh, for the second child in October of 2005. Uh, during the course of the relationship, it was very toxic. There was fighting, arguing, um, stealing, a number of things, Your Honor. Um, we officially split in 2005, um, toward the end of November. In 2006 is when we did our second, we received the DNA for our second child, which, of course, he was the father. At that point, they ordered a second child support order of $250 a month, 127 for each child. Okay, before you get further into the child support you're suing him about, let me allow him to give some background, sir. From day one, Erica Hoyt was very deceptive and um, deceiving. Uh, she was 15 years old. She lied about her age to me. Um, it wasn't until a year after that when she actually told me how old she really was. My grandmother got custody of Erica Hoyt due to the fact of her father being murdered and her mother didn't have a healthy home environment for her to live. So Erica Hoyt was amended or emancipated to my grandmother, if that's the correct word. Mm -hmm, um, I couldn't went to jail for 40 years for the lie that she told me to begin with. 40? Well, there's now, there's a whole nother topic that's going on between Judge Mathis. Y'all know how he is when it comes down to a man not paying his child support and it and a man hitting on a woman. So if you want to see more of that, you know, video, please look up dodging child support two days ago. You'll find it. So I just wanted to put that out there to show you that women do lie. Women can be manipulative. You know, there is those women out there to just grab the bag, you know, especially when they don't have anything to lose. And you have a lot of women who had nothing to lose who was around Robert. So I'm going to leave a few minutes in the chat. I just want to get on here and 
share with this, share with you this information that I found today along with the motion. I hope that it helps. I don't know. I don't know. But I just want to get your point of views about it. And um, I hope you guys have a wonderful day. I hope you have been having a good day. And I will keep you posted on the next situation that comes up from the court. I'm not going to do anything today. I'm going to wait, let it marinate. And hopefully tomorrow there will be something on. But this motion I needed to put on our Kelly Appeal TV for the purpose of historical information. So I thank you so much for liking, commenting, sharing, and subscribing to this podcast. Keep a prayer going for Mr. Robert Sylvester Kelly. And with that, keep it 100 and we'll see you next time.